Happy Friday night, everybody. Guess what? It's cocktail night. I am sorry to keep you waiting. I completely lost track of the time. Happy Friday. Can you see there's something going on here? I've got a couple of swatch watches going. I've got this kind of action. I've got a lot of this kind of stuff happening. It is a throwback night to 1981 because I found the most exciting book. Oh, come on in. <laughs> Jossie says, hi. Happy Friday night, everybody. It is a throwback night. I found a very exciting decorating book, and it looks like this that we are about to share together. And what does it have to do with rug hooking? Well, quite a bit, because this book is about 500 pages long, circa 81, and it is so much fun to look at because of the design ideas, because of the interior design thrust of this thing. It gives us such insane pictures. I mean, it is such a moment in time. Wait till you see. It has been a lot of fun going through this and I've gotten some great ideas. This is not one of them. This was just like an afterthought. Happy Friday, everybody. It's great to see you. I was just choking on some ramen noodles and I just could not uh, pull it together. A little bit late. And what kind of beer is it tonight? Flower power. I'm going to have a beer tonight instead of a wine. I'm just, I'm feeling very, very light. I'm not feeling well at all, but we're going to do this and it's going to be a fun night. Linda, good to see you. Cheers, my dears. Let me take the first cheer with uh, the first uh, sip without slurping too much, right? <clears throat> oh, those ramen noodles were so spicy. Mm. I slurped. Oh, that's good, though. Oh, that's good. You know, if I pour it into a cup, I won't be such a barbarian, will I? Kirsten, good to see you, Teresa. Happy Friday. I'm going to do a transfer here so I don't have to slurp. <clears throat> Lately, people have been putting such nice comments on the, on the board, I think because I had a secret battle with a prominent person in the rug hooking world. I was suddenly getting slammed with nasty comments. Not lately. Everybody's been very nice. Not talking about my germs or my slurping or anything disgusting that I do, <clears throat> except on Friday nights, right? Teresa, happy Friday. And uh, cheers, my dears. Becky, happy Friday evening to you too. Excited about this one. You graduated from high school in 81. Oh, gee. You know, it's so unfair that it's vintage now. You're right, it is. <laughs> it's vintage. Um, but it's just so weird. This language is a shape-shifting thing, isn't it? Because we didn't ha used to have sort of milestone words for things that happened at different decade breaks. It's something new that we do. It's very strange. I don't accept it personally. I don't accept it at all. <clears throat> I'm right behind you, too, so don't feel bad at all. We'll be in it together. Oh, Catalina, good to see you. Linda H., good to see you. Happy cocktail night in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Karen, happy cocktail night. Cheers, my dears. Kaz, good to see you. Happy Friday from Wisconsin. Aileen, hello in Toronto. I have more Toronto talk at the end of the episode today. And Dave sent me a wonderful letter with some... Dave, let me see if he's on. I'll wait and see if he's on. He sent me some cool samples of some stuff he had been dying that I want to show you. <clears throat> Barbara, great to see you. Happy Friday. Sandra, happy Friday. Great to see you. You still remember your swatch watch? Do you remember which one it was? They all had names. Now, I don't remember the names, but I do remember that when I wore two, it would completely um, demoralize all of the other girls around me, which wasn't what I was really going for, but it was just like a, a bit of a power thing, right? I mean, there were some girls that had them all the way up their arms. I was doing I was doing this too. You can see I spent a lot of time poorly today. That's clear, isn't it? But um, I remember one of my friends had this one. Um, I think I know who it was. Vague memory. Not great, not great relationship these days. But my friend Vanessa had this one and she had all the great stuff. So when I found them later, I snapped them up because they remind me of those days. But man, I remember those girls wearing them. And that was a little bit later, I think. <clears throat> We're going to look at some fun. Oh, no. I forgot to print out my cheat sheet. Oh, no. How am I going to get to that? I'm going to have to try to do something by memory. I had a cheat sheet I wanted to print out. What a dingling a ring dong. We'll figure it out. I'll get there in the end. I was going to do a bit of 1981 trivia. I'll see if I can remember some of those. Barbara, happy Friday, and Sandra, Aileen, yep, you remember your swatch. I got to remember which, you know, I know I had a yellow one, and the thing was, for whatever reason, because I've never had class, you know, but for whatever reason, I chose, like, the only swatch watch at the time that didn't look like this. It just looked like a regular watch. It was yellow around the edge, like mustard, but the rest of it was black, and it wasn't super exciting, so I have identified, like, the one that I got that was the first one that was, like, super important. But um, I don't want it again because it just looks like a regular watch. I want the ones that look crazy, you know, crazy 19 eras 
era. Lisa, TGIF, thankful that it's a weekend and time for cocktail night. Amen. Cheers. <laughs> Those usually don't go together, right? Dave, good to see you. <laughs> well, not really. I could have done a lot better, but I, I fell asleep. I had a very emotional and difficult day. Um, and then I woke up and I choked on the noodles and it's just, it's been a little bit seat of the pants. I could have gone even further with this, but next time. I, I feel like, you know, there's so much material out there. The only reason I locked into 81 was because of this book. And I thought this book was so good um, as a starting point, as a design reference, as a color reference, as just a conversation starter. And um, I thought, you know, there's going to be a lot of years out there that we can cover in a lot of books. That's a lot of episodes for us to look at. Because I also crossed this book with an issue also from 81 of Rug Cooking News and Views, which later became Rug Cooking Magazine, but was still called News and Views. So I looked at that too, and we have some of those images to look at at the end of the episode. Um, fun, fun, fun. Pizza Insider there. Oh, that sounds so good. So good. Donna, good to see you. Me too. I'm surprised. I kind of like it. Probably looks, aw yeah, it looks awful. We're not even going to go there. I look like I'm bald and aged, aged, aged. Um, this looks a little more cute, I think. We'll, we'll keep a frontal view going here. Kathleen, great to see you. Happy Friday from Easton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> It'll be a fun night. I'm excited. Your, Dave, your swatch watch was gray, gray and white. Now that sounds quite 80s, doesn't it? I was thinking about this while I was putting this episode together, the palette of the 80s, right? It changed a little bit because really in 81, we were just coming out of the 70s and those earthy colors which had a powerful pull for people still. But when you get a little bit further into the 80s, I think they're much more associated with these kinds of colors, right? They're real brights. And I was thinking, you know, when I think back to that palette, because that was my that was my time, um, I think about very neon and bright colors. And I think because it was such a, a distinctive color palette, did they sort of employ the, the um, premise of DL, DB, dark light, dull, bright? And I'm thinking, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I mean, what do you think? This is an open for conversation. When I think about it, their darks, I mean, certainly black was used because we talk about Keith Haring a lot, that black and outlining and that whole graphic look was a big part of design. But um, I remember navy blue being right up there with black as the dark, right? I didn't, I don't remember brown, you know, into the more middle 80s as really being a thing. That was, we left that kind of in the 70s but certainly black always, but also um, navy being, in my opinion, the principal dark. And then for light, of course there was white, there was white t-shirts and white sneakers and things like that. But I associate the light for this period as being something more like, do you remember all those kind of, they were ice cream colors. Like there was a light blue, like a Tiffany blue. There was certainly a pistachio and a light peach that I think were the most prominent. They weren't um, real predictable pastels. And then, of course, uh, dark, light, dull. So for the dulls, we're going to get into that when we look at this book. They, the, the principal dull, in my opinion, for this period was the dusty rose color. Remember dusty rose? Still my favorite color. It was a rose color, like a pink, <clears throat> that was not, was not bright at all. It was really tempered with like either brown or gray. And it was sometimes moving more toward a grayish purple color, but the dusty rose was grounded in like a, it had a warm feeling to it. It wasn't um, a pink pink. I just, I just love that color still. So dark, light, dull. We already know what the brights are. They were tons of neons, tons of neons, every color of neon. It was an exciting time for art and for color. And it was like, almost like in the 60s, we hit that pop, um, uh, pop art culture, pop art, uh, op art. And it was so graphic and primary and bright. And then the pendulum swung to the 70s and people were like, done with this. No more summer of love, no more pop art, right down to the earthy colors. You know, we're getting like really sort of um, um, nature driven colors and nothing else. And then we hit the 80s immediately after and the pendulum swung very far again and was like, nope, we're going back for those real brights and those really, really intense colors. So it's just funny how that, it just keeps changing again and again and again. We haven't seen that kind of, in my opinion, um, really colossal shift every decade as we did then from 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s was kind of a spillover. And now it's just kind of a little bit of everything, right? Everybody's so busy being so individual and cool that they do what, whatever they want, which is obviously a good thing too. 
But um, yeah, it just hasn't, the, the decades for me, maybe it's just because I'm not paying attention because I'm getting older, <clears throat> they don't seem to have that kind of distinction and definition, <clears throat> ramen noodles, that they did way back, way back then. Did I say that? I didn't mean to say that. We're not talking vintage tonight. No way. Wendy, good to see you. Good evening in Western Pennsylvania. Courtney, hello. Good to see you. Caroline, you are not late. We are just revving up. Cheers, my dears, to you. Joan, great to see you. It's Friday, and happy Friday. Great to see you in Canada. Dave Hunter Green in the late 80s. That's a good one. That's a very good one. Hunter Green, I forgot about that. That was right up there, neck and neck with Navy. Navy was big, too. But they, it, it didn't go all the way to black. It was almost like <clears throat> there was such a drive to have so much color that they, they, nobody really wanted to go full black and white. They didn't want to go to the extremes. They wanted to stay in the middle where there was still color, like the brightest and most intense version of every color that you can think of. That's a very good one. That's where Hunter Green really got traction, isn't it? Mm. Karen Pink. Yep, absolutely. Pink, for me, you know, for at least in our house, it was um, Dusty Dusty Rose um, was like, was a biggie. And for me, and my wallpaper in those days was like the gray, right, Dave? Like the gray, and it was cream, not white. And I had a lot of butterflies. And the butterflies were those light colors that were like uh, peach, kind of a salmony, corally pink, and a lilac. They were off colors, right? They weren't right on the beam like you know, real true pastels. They were right off center. So cool. But I mean, after a while, you could hardly see the wallpaper because I had so many Def Leppard posters and Duran Duran and the police and all that stuff. It was such a fun time for music too. Ida, great to see you. T-G-I-F indeed. Sharon, great to see you. Cheers. Lauren, I stenciled light blue geese with dusty rose bows around the walls of my daughter's bedroom. I hope it's still there. That sounds like a masterpiece. I know that's the very kind of thing that was in, went out, but now it's back in. And in my opinion, you know, dusty rose geese with bows around their necks is never a bad move. I would always be up for that. I, I'm one of these idiots that, you know, I've moved a lot, um, always. But whenever I go into a house and there's like stuff that other people might consider dated, I, that's my favorite part. Not so much the 70s stuff, but like the hand painting and the painted floors and the stenciling on the walls and around the edges of the room. I just love that stuff. That's my favorite part. Such a moment in time, you know. <laughs> Aileen says, I remember there was a lot of beige too. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of beige in clothing for sure because that there was all that the khaki stuff. We didn't do that much with jeans, at least where I was in Rhode Island. It was a lot of khakis, you know, that you would fold and then roll up a little bit. And then the sneakers with no socks, which was certainly um, guaranteed to give lots of blisters. But, you know, when you're that age or teenage or a kid or whatever, um, you don't really feel pain. It's every, There are so much more important things, like if the captain of the football team knows you're alive. It, things like comfort and blisters, those don't even hit the radar. That was just pff, nothing. Tiny little war wounds. <laughs> it's good times. I think, you know, most of us have, uh, well, hopefully great memories of that time. It was certainly a good time for the economy, <laughs> for travel, for fun, for excitement, for <clears throat> TV shows. Because I screwed up on this trivia thing, let me try to do this uh, off the top of my head. I was, well, let me ask you this question first. And you are on a delay, so I'll let you answer. Most, most obvious 80s questions, if you are American or not, president in in 1981 you must remember who that was i won't say it i'll let you type it in and i was looking up the most popular um for example songs ah oh, see i'm gonna have to look at my sheet to do that i'll have to post that later i looked up i had a trivia question for you this was the trivia question what stephen king movie came out in 1981 the year that this book that we're going to work on tonight came out was it carrie was it Cujo, or was it, help me out here, Salem's Lot. Oh, that was my favorite. Remember him in the window? You had to invite him in and open your window, and it was all over. <clears throat> Do you remember which one, without looking, was 1981? Because two of those movies were 70s movies. I'll give you a hint. Only one crossed right over into 1981. I'll see if somebody gets it. Oh, Dave, I forgot the acid wash jeans. That is very true. It was Reagan. It was. That's the first president. Well, I remember Jimmy Carter because I remember, you know, everybody talking about his uh, peanuts and his farm and all that stuff. 
but um, for me, Reagan was the first one that I really remember. And I thought, thought he was, I thought he was great. I was just looking at the Time Magazine cover of him just a little while ago. So see if you know the answer to the Stephen King question. What were some of the other ones I came up with? Um, see, I'm never going to, I had this sheet and I forgot to print it out. TV show that debuted. Okay, let, let me try to do this in my head first. Let's take a sip. Let me calibrate. TV show that debuted in 1981. Was it Growing Pains? Was it The Facts of Life? Or was it The Greatest American Hero? See if you can answer that one <clears throat> without looking. Aileen, it, it wasn't Carrie. It wasn't. No, but you're close. <clears throat> Carrie was one of the nights that was on my sheet too. That was one of the 1970s one. So the one that was 1981, obviously it was a little bit later, but it was one of the other two. Absolutely, Joan. It absolutely was. And she was a power woman in the White House. There's been a few of those lately. Um, not super lately, but in the in the more distant past. Carrie was 78. You're right, Kaz. Carrie was 78. That was a traumatizing movie too, wasn't it? With all that blood paint coming down. I mean, that is one that I will <clears throat> not forget anytime soon. Awesome. That was an awesome movie. Of those, for me, Salem's Lot was my favorite. It had the most sort of atmosphere to it, and I was really... Um, confused and frightened about the the vampire element of it the um car one um which one was the car one that was christine wasn't it that was another c was that christine the car that had like a life of its own they were all so traumatizing i still as much as i think he's cool and i love where he's from and i love bangor his town <clears throat> i still can't handle those kinds of movies they are they they get in your head and it's like it's cujo it was Cujo, Lisa. It was Cujo, because Salem's Lot was earlier in the 70s, too. Kaz says, I saw Carrie in Dallas, Texas, when I was an exchange student. Scary, right? They were just so, oh, they were so much. Oh, Mom, I am. I posted I had a very bad day today. So let me, let me catch up with you first. You know, I'm not going to say it's a completely bad day, and I do believe that everything happens for a reason. And as much as I complain and whine, um, I am a lemons person, I'm making lemons out of lemonade person. Um, so I had to change the date of the class on Cape Cod. So the good news and the bad news, it sounds like it, we're going for next Sunday, which is April 3rd. Um, it sounds like the people who are signed up for it, because it was almost sold out, that it sounds like just about everybody's going to make it, if not everybody, which is wonderful. But it does mean that there's another week. If you would like to take the Amish toothbrush class, shoot, I wanted to show you the Amish toothbrush rug. I have it with me. I'll show you on Monday. But, you know, I've been dyeing all of this um, cotton, all of these sheets and things. It's like a recycling thing. All these different colors, and some of them have lots of patterns and stuff. Tons, like probably 10 pounds of <clears throat> sheets that we're going to rip up and make these Amish toothbrush rugs, which are true rag rugs that you make with a little tool, the broken off toothbrush, but they're nice hard wood ones that I order from a guy on Etsy. <clears throat> so that is being switched to next um, next Sunday, which is also nice because my book is due this week, and the day before my book is due, I have a project image that needs to go into Green Mountain because I'm going to be teaching there in November, a Prati project, and I need to get that done too. So maybe it's a blessing in disguise, um, but unfortunately I brought my car in for an oil change and there was a major engine problem. So I'm hoping it's under warranty because it's. I've been very vigilant about keeping that car together and man, it was not good news. Um, I was even scared to go pick up Teddy after I heard that the engine was in such a bad, quote, rough state. Um, there's apparently like a recall on the, this car because of the valve, but you don't, this is something to know. <clears throat> they don't send you a recall thing unless it's a health issue. And having a valve that malfunctions and, and produces a situation with like insane amounts of oil consumption, because my oil is basically always empty. I filled it up two days ago and it was empty when I took it in today. It's been like that for five years since I've had the car. And they keep telling me, oh, it just uses a lot of oil. And I'm thinking, it doesn't use a quart of oil every two days. I mean, that's not possible because it's not leaking. They've looked at it a hundred times, couldn't find anything, and now there's engine damage, right? So we're gonna leave that one alone because I'll like blow, uh, flip my flipper or something. But um, the thing to know is that it's worth checking your car's you know, um, date and make every once in a while because they will not send you something unless it's a safety thing, but you do wanna know if the car is being pulled just in your random round of, of doodling and Googling, right? Like to put in your car make and it might be that something just popped up, that there's something wrong that you might wanna address that they are not gonna tell you about. Whew, what a wind-up world it is, isn't it? 
Um, oh, did they, Lisa, recently do a remake of Christine and Carrie? Ooh, Joan says, yes, Christine and the stand. Oh, yeah. Cat's Gallery, Salem's Lot made me cry because of it. Yeah, there was a lot of emotion in that one. It was, For me, I was too young to like really be emotionally affected by that part of it. But I was just so scared of the vampire with the wig. It was one of those things. I was behind the couch and I wasn't supposed to be seeing it in the first place. Uh, it was one of those traumatizing things that I think about all the time. Like the weird moments where I'm like putting down a shade and I'm thinking, what was his name? Barlow or Marlow or something? Thinking he's going to be out there with his eyes and be like, can I go in? And I'd be stupid enough to be hypnotized to go, sure, come on in. He come in and bites everybody in the family and kills all of us. Oh, man. Oh. All right, but Buttons is staying with my mom, and he's hearing my voice and going crazy. That's so cute. Mm. Did you figure out what TV show, TV show of those three premiered in 1981? I didn't, I didn't see any guesses. Maybe it's not one that struck you all. It was The Greatest American Hero. For me at that time, that was the best show that had ever, ever been, and that premiered in 1981. So it was just fun looking back to do the research on this episode of the things that were in then, you know, let's look at some of the things that were in then, and then we'll then we'll back up a little bit. Let's look at. I did a little bit of a 1981 um, rundown to put us in the mood. Well, this is the first thing I have to show you. Get ready for a shameful picture. This is an 81. I think this is 83, and I th I know that because I'm wearing a Def Leppard Pyromania shirt. Sally, good to see you. You just got your hook. I'm so glad. Let's stay on top of it and keep updated. I gave you some lights, darks, dulls, everything. We'll talk about it, but I, I hope it's a very nice kit. I loved putting it together for you. You are there. I knew what you meant. Um, this is a picture from, I, again, I think it's 83, so a little bit later, but I couldn't find a lot of pictures. Shameful picture here. I mean, look at this. Look at this. I've got the barn door half open here with my zipper coming down. That's my sister, Jessica, who now works at the uh, British Museum at Yale as a restorer our Scott Terrier and my dad wearing his plaid pants that are going to be the best heirloom rug hooking piece that I will ever do in my life. I just have to pace myself because um, there, there's only this one pair of pants from him and he passed away years ago and I wanna make something, a pillow that includes this textile for both me, my sister and my mom because these were the pants he shamed us with every Thanksgiving and Christmas. And even though he kind of changed sizes, right, Mom, a little bit as he grew older, the pants always seemed to fit. We always thought, well, one of the benefits of changing size and shape a little bit is the pants. We're not going to see those pants anymore, but we st we still saw the pants. Like, we always saw the pants. I thought, what are these things made out of? Like, bubble gum? They're just, like, indefinitely stretching, you know, unlimited stretch. So that was that was this this person around that time desperately trying to be cool and fit in right desperately and let me show you some of the other things I got so this is from a magazine right remember what was it then like Spiegel was a big one then and I know Sears was a big one this looks more like a Spiegel thing from that I don't think it was flash dance yet <laughs> Joan your dad had the same pants they were mortifying it was like I, somehow I don't know they were so loud you know everywhere we went all these fancy places uh, Sally says, I wanted one of those woolly lamb kits, but you were, oh, I'm never out. I'm never out. I'll put it back in stock, Sally. I've just been busy with this book, and I haven't wanted to do a lot of starting from scratch projects, but um, because the book will have to be in on the 31st, and I am in pretty good target for that, um, if you're seeing things that are out of stock, just let me know, because starting next week and even the end of this week, I will be able to be working at my full capacity again, and the girl who helps me, who works with me, Erin, um, I can throw some work her way too. So just let me know what you're looking for. Nothing is truly out. It's just, I've had a, um, you know, um, a, a, well, none of these are appropriate. I was doing paper hanger, one-legged man, race. None of these are okay. You know what I mean? I've been busy as a moth in a sweater closet and that's the only reason things went out of stock. Right, Kaz? These were, I guess these are the 80 colors, the, the leg warmers. I mean, the sad thing is I was wearing outfits like this even when I went to college um, and I studied dance in college, like at college level with my lumpy body and my friend saw me wearing these clothes and that was the reason that I really had to leave my sophomore year because I could not take the <coughs> jokes, jokes, that's in quotes, the not really bullying, just, yeah, horrible jokes and stuff like this. So this shows us the kind of pastel colors that were in then Cheryl Teague. She was so beautiful, right? 
I had a beautiful one of Christy Brinkley, too, because she was my favorite since she was with Billy Joel, and he was always my favorite. He's still my favorite. He's coming He's coming on tour, and he's going to be at um, Madison Garden, um, Madison Square Garden. What is it? September, I think, 9th. So I got to book tickets for that. But uh, Cheryl Teagues was another icon of this era, and she is showing us white. So at least in fashion, white was big. This would have been the, the summer palette. Uh, for 1981, the year that we're talking about tonight. So these are the kinds of colors we're looking for. These are off-center colors. Even the pink is not a dead-on pink. The peach is not a dead-on peach. They're all a little bit off-center. You know what I mean? They're not like baby pastel palette. They're they're different. They have something extra. Aileen says, glad. Yeah, I know. Glad some things went out of style, right? Not all this. But this is super pretty. I mean, this would not suit me at this particular moment. But this is a super pretty look, I think. Some of this was um, Madonna in 1981, right? I had never seen this picture of her. She certainly changed her look and her image. I'm not sure for the better. She looks nice and healthy then. And of course, Princess Diana in 1981. She was always such a fashion icon. But looking at the stuff she was wearing now, it's, you know, it's it seems very dated. But of course, at the time, it was thrilling to see these outfits on her. It was the ab absolute height of sophistication. Oh, wait a minute, I did that one. Oh, Brooke Shields. Um, yeah, this is a 1981 Times cover. This followed the Ronald Reagan cover uh, for Man of the Year, the 80s look, right? I'd love to get this and just flip through it. But the leggings, yeah, I know, Aileen, those leggings were dreadful. And those sashes around the waist, right? Um, that was the thing that got me in dance class where the, the big sashes like cummerbunds around the waist. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. I just did, had no discernment when it came to things like that. I, and I was studying costume and wardrobe. You'd think I'd have a better sense, but dance costume was just not on my radar. I did absolutely everything wrong. Mm. So Dave sent me this. This was a cool thing to get. Oh my gosh, I got another cool thing too. Um, it's post-it note ideas and we are still looking Kirsten you'll be happy to hear Dave sent some post-it note design ideas and Dave these swatches of the wool blanket that you dyed are absolutely beautiful these are these mixed colors that you did or are these straight on colors and you said jacquard dyes I sometimes use the jacquard dyes too and I'll tell you I don't recognize any of these colors I thought I had them all and I like the jacquards but they seem they're always sort of very traditional to me and I can't I can't find a color from them that gives real oomph but this lime green is very oomph, and this apricot is a true apricot, right? Because the Cushing apricot is very, very, very pale. But then when you look at varieties of peach and other colors, it doesn't have enough oomph. This peach is really pretty. And this tomato color, I have got to know how you did that. Tomato is one of the hardest colors for me to get because it's such a blue red, but it could easily go to purple, right? It's so hard to get tomato right. Honestly, tomato, I think, is my favorite year-round color, so I would love to know how you did that with the jacquard dyes. And you sent me the, oh, an over dyed sweater. See, Dave is up to all of this business up there in Toronto, over dyeing stuff and using repurpose stuff and recycle stuff. You're getting such cool effects um, with unique things, right? You're not like working with Dormill, you're using unique things. And I love to see that. And I'm always talking about the famous dish cloth, right? That Dave used at the height of COVID. Um, when it was such a hard, hard problem getting supplies from anybody, uh, backing fabrics, Dave started hooking into, he sent me a piece of the famous dishcloth and he said it worked great. And what makes it, what made it work great hooking into this dishcloth? Well, it's a nice open weave, isn't it? I mean, it's got a little bit of stretch, just like linen or burlap or monk's cloth or anything would, but it's a nice open weave. It's very giving and forgiving. And when you're working with something like this, it's almost like I can't stop with the Ritomere. It's almost like that Ritomere feel that you can leave part of the background blank, right? Like uncovered because there's so much going on in the background. It, you'd at least have the possibility if you wanted to, leaving some of it exposed. And I think that it's a really smart idea. I'm glad I, I was visualizing a much different dish rag. So I'm very, I'm very happy that that came together. Susan sent me, um, um, Susan Barnard is in our Facebook group. I don't, I don't think Susan's usually on live. She's up in Maine. And she has been doing some wonderful, Dave says, the lime green is jacquard chartreuse, jacquard chartreuse color. Uh, apricot is jacquard salmon. Interesting, is it? Okay, let me look at it again. I'm surprised because to me that isn't pink enough at all to be salmon. That is way apricot. 
That is a really good color, isn't it? That's exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about a pastel that is off center, right? Because that is in between. That is really, that's moving almost toward like a gray, right? Like not gray, but it's tinged with something, right? Not something sinister, just something a little bit darker, right? But it, somehow the intensity of the value hasn't changed. It's a very unique color. That's a really cool color. So chartreuse, um, salmon, also tomorrow, red eyes. Oh, you put a little red into the salmon. That's why it looks into the salmon. This one is you put a little bit of red into this one. What about the um, what about the tomato? I'm such a predator. I'm looking for you don't have to give up the recipe, by the way. I'm an awful predator, but I have yet to find a tomato that I like as much as I like your tomato. It sounded like a Valentine, didn't it? Susan has been doing the most amazing um, designing and she was moving and she was busy for a while and she wasn't doing so much. Um, I bought um, at least one or two of her Magdalena designs a year or two ago and I was working on those, still working on those. Uh, but she has been putting up the most beautiful stuff, often with a very nautical flavor because she's from Maine, right? So that's what she knows and that's what she feels. But I remarked a while back on this particular piece that she did because I don't know if she if we were talking about, if she was inspired at all by the idea of doing the Mackenzie Childs um, border, because that was right around that time. And I can't remember if that was part of our conversation, but she posted this rug and I said, Susan, I'm just, I'm flipping it. Um, I love this so much. I love the traditional bouquet. She designed this. Um, and again, she's in our Facebook group, which is Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club with this checkered top and bottom and I am just so crazy about this rug and she sent it to me she finished it and she sent it to me for keepsies so that's going to be something that I am going to it's all different cuts too let me show you close up it's so pretty I love seeing all different cuts this is one of the reasons I'm still a big advocate of cutting strips with scissors I know it sounds harrowing but you know when you have all different widths in there it creates such interest, doesn't it? I just love it. And she, she does very loose hooking. It's very impressionistic hooking. I just love it. Susan, if you are watching, I just love it. Thank you so much. I don't deserve such nice gifts. I really don't. I'm really a rotten little pig at the end of the day. You should have seen the scenes that I made at the, at the um, Firestone. <laughs> you won't go there. Um, it's beautiful, Kaz, isn't it? It really is. Tomato red, Dave said. Jackard salmon. Okay, sorry, you already said that. In a much stronger concentration of salmon. Really? Nothing else? Just the jackard salmon for the tomato red? That is really crazy. Aileen, isn't that beautiful? I know. I'm spoiled. I'm so spoiled. Um, I've got to buy a bunch of patterns for her, too, because she's been doing some beauties lately now that she's back into the saddle and she's just feeling it. Comes and it goes, doesn't it? So... You know, let's let's get going with this. And I'll try to think of some more trivia questions as we go on because I had a whole bunch for you. I'm so angry at myself. I had songs and all kinds of pop culture. But this book I picked up as a bedside book the other night. And I'll tell you, just looking at the cover, let me show it to you on the thing. Um, I started to get really inspired because it was, it was immediately bringing up the 80s for me, which was a very, um, I guess it was a happy time. I was at school and all that, you know, um, and stressful, you know, it was always stressful, uh, inter, inter teen relationships at that time, but it was an exciting time and fashion was fun and Esprit shirts were colorful and the swatch watches were fun and, uh, the CB jackets and everything that was going on that, you know, touched my little tiny world still being quite young. And when I looked at this cover, I thought, man, I just love this, this place in time. I mean, if you look at this room, this does not scream 80s to me at all. There's a beautiful rug down. Now, do we ever talk about doing rugs like this? Hey, Susie. Do we ever talk about doing these kinds of rugs that have this kind of Eastern European flavor, but are done in brights and, well, not even pastels, in this case, just brights. I mean, what a brilliant, Robin, if you are on tonight, by the way, your rug came out beautiful. Your Helen Albee came out beautiful. Um, that was super primary, very graphic, very cool palette. Just reminded me of it because it's a similar kind of a look. But, you know, looking at those patterns, and I designed a ton of them for that Helen Albee time that we were covering that, and we'll return to that someday. But it never occurred to me to use these kinds of colors in a rug. 
And of course, white is a different, different, difficult color unless you're like a no shoes household. But so many things about this picture really struck me. The rug, the dusty rose kind of furniture. Look at the mix of pinks. Like they've got other pink pillows going on there that you would think that really doesn't match. But you know, it does. It's leaning more toward purple. They're both off the beam colors. They're both off center colors. Neither is pink or purple. That's part of the reason they work together. And they're the same um, value, right? In terms of brightness, they're about the same tone. One is not much more intense or dark than the other, so it works. This beautiful sky blue color, remember 1981, you're coming right out of the 70s. What an unusual palette. How fresh and bright this must have felt after all those Brady Bunch years, right? Look at the amount of plants in the uh, living room and satin jacket flashback, Karen says. Oh, absolutely. Oh, God, yes. Satin jacket flashback. But some of these elements, like this dark, dark, dark furniture, right? Very Queen Anne, dark finished furniture. That was really in with the light colors of that time. And you know what? At least in my mind, I think it goes great with all of those indoor plants, with that basket on the hearth. Isn't this the era that you really must have a basket on the hearth and also at least one, if not in this case, three different vases up on your mantle? I mean, it's such a mismatched room, but I must have stared at the cover for I don't know how long until I fell asleep, as long as I could, because it was speaking to me on so many different levels, and it was giving me immediate ideas about color palettes and designs, right? And I'm going to say, as we look at the books, I'm going to blow through these the book uh, fairly quickly because, oop, we already saw those. Getting rid of that. We don't need that twice in one night, do we? Um, it had so many interesting things that were such part of this moment in time. And I think that for us, particularly those of us who are interested, not just in rug making, but rug design and um, well, designing, right, composition, it's so interesting to look at what the aesthetic is in other periods of, of design. And certainly the 80s is distinct, right? You, you would never mistake 80s design for 70s or really 90s, right? Because it fizzled right out. It flattened right out like a soda that just went flat overnight for me. Um, that's obviously, that's my opinion. But, you know, the 80s was really full blast and then it, for me it watered right down. So let's look at some of the ideas first as we build up into rugs and looking at rugs. Let's look at what design was about. Um, this book had some really funny moments. Funny, I'm using ironically, for example, does anybody have this principle in their head anymore? 1981, basic furnishings budget. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm just, I, I mean, I know, we all know that I'm not a grown-up yet, but, um, um, you know, emotionally or mentally, but basic furnishings budget, I never heard of this, for a five-room house or apartment. It's telling us that the living room foyer should be 40% of our decorating budget. That seems like a lot. I mean, that must be based on the idea that you're going to have a lot of wacky, questionable parties, right? And a lot of company over. The dining area is at 20%. The, what they're calling the master bedroom, the, the, the bedroom that everybody has to have the master now, right? Everybody, nobody can live without the Property Brothers master bathroom with like six different ante rooms. That drives me nuts. But in those days, we just called it the double bedroom because two people were in there, typically. 18%, that comes right behind the dining room. The, the single bedroom... Um, a little bit behind and then you know distantly in the back is the kitchen at 10% no mention of any of the other rooms and I think that might be part of the reason why you know when we talk about we, especially with Ritamir this past week there was so much talk about um, there are categories of rugs like for example for the hobby room for the playroom for his den for rooms that wouldn't be on this pie chart, right? They weren't in the budget. And that might be part of the reason that there are so many ideas, both in the Ritamere catalog, 1970s and 80s craft catalogs, the McCalls, all of those that, you know, had special editions almost every month for crafts. Um, that might be the reason they were promoting so aggressively the idea of making rugs, not particularly for the floor, but for the wall was because there was no budget for the for the other rooms, right? Just for the primary rooms, I thought, that's very telling, isn't it? So let's see. Let me come back over here, get rid of this pie chart. I thought that was really <clears throat> surprising. We get a lot of this, too. So, you know, you know, I know we get this to this day, but it just seems so 
strange to me. There, half of this book, and the book is almost 500 pages, is about telling you what looks right and what looks wrong. Now, as somebody who thinks a lot about composition and design, I have to say the bottom one doesn't look as powerful to me. It doesn't look as eclectic. It doesn't look as artful, right? But I wouldn't say that it's wrong. I'm not sure that that's the correct word. It really depends on the person's taste. And I feel like as time has gone on, as, you know, all the publications that we have and now the internet, I think that people have changed a little bit. And I think there is a little bo bit more wiggle room for the idea that you might like it the way that it is on the bottom, very spaced out, very mathematical, um, very um, breathing room in between each image. You might not want them the way they are on the top, whatever it is, whatever your designing is, if it's decorating, if it's designing a rug, whatever it is, you might not like the type one, the top one, but the thing is that in these books from this era, there is so much of them telling you absolutely black and white what is what is right and what is wrong. Isn't that a funny thing? This comes back to this um, color me beautiful thing. We'll come to that in a second. Mm. So let me ask you this. This is a little quiz that the book set up for us. I thought this was interesting. It talks about. Oh, I'm wondering if I have my other glasses. Let me just grab this pair. I think these are stronger. This book is asking us, um, it's talking about what image you want to uh, project, right? With whatever you're working on. So if you're decorating, you're decorating. If you're working on a rug, what image do you want to project? It's helping you in this book. It's, it's very much in part a workbook. And it's saying, you know, what's your object? What are you like? What do you like? And it gives you a lot of prompts um, so that you can think about things that maybe you don't typically think about not important, right? Things that you did, would not come up in the normal course of the day. So there's a whole section on what image do you want your home and your decorating to project? And I'm going to add specifically rugs, right? Whether they're on the walls or the floor, what image do you want them to project? Because we're often just theme driven or image driven. Like it's already there. It's a commercial pattern. It's Easter. I'm taking it. I'm making it and I'm putting it on the wall. But the question, the bigger question is what image do you mean to put across, particularly in really public rooms? If you are having wild parties, then people are going to come over. You want them to see your decorating and to put together vignettes that you think are absolutely not just to your taste, but represent you and the people who live in your house, right? That's important. That's what makes it a home. So for example, just think about these questions as we go along. And if you have a pencil, mark them down. There's only a few. It's, it's about to tell us, color me beautiful style, what you, who you are and what you like. Okay, so take it with a grain of salt, but get ready because here it comes. Do you like, now it says, your favorite time of the day is, is it number one, early morning when sunlight sparkles and the air is crystal clear? Sounds good. Two, late afternoon when the shadows lengthen and the dus dusk is a promise. This is very poetic for a, for a, decorating workbook, right? Or three, any time after 8 p.m. So either mark it in your head or mark it down. Which one are you? Number one, early morning. Number two, late afternoon. Number three, anytime. Your favorite colors are number one, crisp, clean, primary colors and the warm earth tones. Or number two, lively but soft blues, greens, golds, more spirited than pastels. Or number three, black, white, beige, and offbeat brights like coral and lime. That's a better way of saying, I say off-center and off the beam, offbeat brights like coral and lime. They're not in the middle, right? They're not that pastel middle between dark and white. So make a choice there too. When you play a party, when you plan a party to celebrate something special, it's likely to be, these glasses are not helping, it's likely to be Number one, a relaxed backyard barbecue for family, friends, and neighbors. Number two, a festive sit-down dinner for six or eight people. Or number three, a simple uh, midnight supper after an evening at the valet. Oh, that sounds good too. They all sound good, don't they? And here's your last question. Uh, for a big evening on the town, a big one, a big night out seeing Barry Manilow and walking around New York City, do you feel most comfortable in, number one, your knitted cashmere dress, oh, that sounds nice, that looks like a long sweater. See, when I think of that, I think about Christy Brinkley, but I wouldn't look like Christy Brinkley in that dress, but that sounds like a beautiful dress. Or number two, a street length dress and jacket in tone on tone brocade. Dave, you're going to have to modify these, of course. Or number three, 
long halter topped culottes, uh oh, um, you made from an Indian bedspread. That is very specific, isn't it? So, what do you think? Try to figure out looking at your numbers or remembering back. If your answers are mostly number ones, you are a warm and friendly person with a penchant for the country look. Your lifestyle is relaxed and informal. You entertain easily and often. Fortunately, the sturdy early American and country French furniture you love holds up well under a steady stream of company. Oh, that sounds so nice, doesn't it? Mom, it sounds like home in the 80s when we used to always have neighborhood parties and work parties in our house and just move all the furniture out of the way and just the grown-ups would go to the living room and the whole dining room table would be moved to the side and all of those, what are those things called? Like those burners that you plugged in, they had like that glass top, remember Bunsen burners? Everybody would bring their potluck stuff that they made, put it in there and then just wander through to the kitchen where there was a big center island and just eat and oh, it was all the time. It was so fun. If you are mostly number two answers, that indicates that you're attracted to the formality and order of the traditional look. You're a meticulous housekeeper and a gracious hostess, and you take pride in your attractive, well-kept home. You admire the polished grace of good period furniture and plan someday to collect antiques. This reminds me, this reminds me, um, Hold on, I'll get there, I'll get there, I'll get there, I'll get there. Oh, wait a minute, I'll come back, I'll come back. Wait a minute, I'm looping back, crossing wires. Let's get to number three first. Um, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. To, pl to someday plan to collect antiques. These are very specific fortunes, aren't they? And if you are a mostly number three person, you're a trend-setting innovator. A contemporary environment is your natural habitat. You're highly original about everything you do, and you have a great fashion flair that spills over into the decorating arena. You find avant-garde furniture exciting and abhor any useless clutter. Now, this has got to be another reference to like the streamlining sort of modern look of the day, right? This reminds me of the movie Big and Karen's thing from the other night, right? Spitting out these really particular fortunes. I'm trying not to say gypsy because I know I'm not supposed to, but I seem to say it in every episode. So if your answers are varied, then obviously you're a cross between, and I think we are all a cross between. But sometimes it's fun uh, to hear, take these kinds of tests, right? It sort of helps to synthesize um, your thoughts sometimes, particularly if you are thinking about designing or decorating or doing something creative that you could use some kind of a blueprint for. It is good to ask yourself these kinds of questions because it can help with clarity, right? But this book is very good. For, I highly recommend this book. It's very, it's a very fun read and it's very smart. It's all paperback too, right? And it's enormous. So this, a lot of this book talks about, for example, your most flattering colors. And this I found super interesting. And this brought me back to this color me beautiful thing we were talking about in the Facebook group. How dare somebody tell me that I'm a winter when I like to wear frosty pink lipstick, right? It's just the way, and, and they still exist, and their products look beautiful, so nothing against the company, of course, but it is just so odd to me um, that at this moment in time, that was also something that was like on the rise, the Color Me Beautiful, where someone would dictate, based on your immediate appearance, what colors you should wear. And I guess the thing that bothers me that about that is the assumption, because I do try to look pretty, even though I'm getting uglier and older, older by the day, I still try, right? I still have that in me. So at the same time, you know, I'm not like, I'm not a, I'm not much of a feminist, or at least I'm not a good one, but I do not like people telling me what colors I should wear because the assumption is that I'm always, my number one goal is to look my best and not to wear things that I like, right? Not to wear my favorite colors. Somehow it's more important that I present myself in a way that I'm wearing colors that are pleasing to look at. So I look in, in myself like as a unit, um, the most maximum pleasing, and it matters less that I don't like those colors, right? That's the thing that bothers me about this whole philosophy. But this book takes it even a step further and talks about your most flattering colors on the wall to match your complexion. Like this is, this is I'm going to say crazy. So it talks about how you should be looking at, like for example, paint colors and textile colors um, that are a certain palette for your fair skin versus, you know, Jossie's like a little nut with a little dark, dark complexion. Um, neutral complexions. It's talking about what colors you should be decorating and using in the backdrop of your house, your personal stage set, 
to match your face and your coloring. I think that's going maybe a little bit too far. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> My mom says, we had some fab parties. Aw. Oh, salt and trays. Is that what they're called? I never heard that. Salt and trays. Table surrounding the room laden with food. Dancing room in the center. Oh, so fun. Susie. Oh, you remember that? I like making it. <laughs> no, not geezers. Not geezers. This is just 1981. That wasn't that long ago. Um, but this book is so helpful uh, with design, with drawing. And I'll tell you, one of the great things about this book, and you're going to see it in a second, is all of these pictures that they do of rooms. If you struggle, if you love to design and you struggle with backgrounds, this is the book for you. I mean, you cannot just obviously outright plagiarize, but there are so many really beautiful drawings that set in a sort of cartoony style, very accessible, that really set up that horizon line and show you things in different places that could really give you a good skeleton for doing a design, right? That was the reason I think I bought this book in the first place. So let's look at some more of the content here. It was... It's going to be a lot of stuff that's irritating, like this right and wrong stuff. But I still like to show it because it's it's interesting. I'm, I still look, even though it triggers me, right? Here's another one. It's, sometimes I go, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is the flowers are more to the left. You have to be very, very persnickety to even be thinking about this. But I see what they're saying, right? They want it to be balanced a bit better. It's, it's a lot of this. <laughs> Being a carbon copy is boring. I agree, Aileen. What's the point, right? What's the point? Disco baby. <laughs> so these are some of the, I mean, it's, again, 500 pages of this. But it's interesting to think about formal balance versus informal balance. I hardly ever think about this. And it is a major part of composition. It's a part. Oh, Lisa says, Jan, that was 40 years ago. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Um, <laughs> it was, and that's not that much though, right? I mean, come on. I, I mean, I realized in 1981, I was nine, right? So I was, um, was I nine? Yeah, I was nine. So I was younger than Teddy. That's crazy. Was I ever younger than Teddy? Uh, it's interesting to think about formal va balance versus informal, because this is one of the aspects of composition we haven't gotten to in our day-to-day -day talks, right? Because this is something, this, this is its own area of conversation. This is a completely separate conversation and it is important. Just thinking whether you are decorating or composing, are you looking for something that is has formal balance and symmetry or something that looks more casual with an informal balance? That is super interesting. I would knock those flowers off the table. Absolutely, Sally. It eliminates that whole problem, right? And they show you things like this. Paula says, my mother's decorating everything balanced and in season. Oh, Paula, that sounds so nice, though. It sounds so nice. I, I'm not that organized anymore. You were 11, Lisa. We were very close to each other. Sometimes it does seem long ago, but sometimes to me it seems like it was just yesterday. I mean, I can picture walking through every room of the house that I grew up in. Every room. I can picture the light switch, the way the wainscoting was, where the little, where the, wallpaper was peeling up a little bit just tiny 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 things I can still picture and weirdly houses that I lived in 10 years ago I can't even remember the street name it's just strange isn't it but they show us a lot of pictures like this and they walk us through a lot of conversations like in terms of decorating right how to cozy up your room that's not what they say but that's basically what they're doing they're giving a room like this gingerbread look with lots of scalloping and soft chairs. There's a little cake right on the sideboard or a counter. Um, gives that homey touch. But it's just a corner of a room, isn't it? It might be a kitchen or it might be a den or whatever. But it's just the idea. It's something that we can transfer into designing too. The idea of cozying up a room is sometimes just adding a few elements. Because with just these antique type spindles, this architectural detail, they have created something that looks more like an ice cream parlor than the corner of a 1981 house, right? And it's just these simple little touches that we have to remember in our own designing that are super easy to do. You know what's not easy to do? Use their chart in this book. They've got pages of these grids, right? It's a grid that you're supposed to, it says something like, let me come to that page. It says something like, you know, try your furniture out here much easier, the easiest way to move your furniture around without actually moving your furniture around. So they give you pages like this, but then get ready. They give you pages of this. Now, hang on. I mean, it seems, it seems practical. It seems like we have a little dollhouse action happening here, 
but only if you have a cocktail table that's 60, that's a 60 inch oval. And only if you have a piano that's 54 by 60 and an end table that's 24 by 26. It's so specific. And of course, it's better than nothing, right? You can always shave down these little things and rearrange them that way. But man, I would never, I would never be able to um, visualize a room um, based on this kind of an exercise. But again, it's just a moment in time. I, I really enjoyed this book more than I can say. It just, there was so much. There was so much that was interesting. This was interesting to me. This is, they do full color, and this isn't one of the full color um, examples, but there's many color wheels in this book. And color wheels, as we know, are super handy. Let me take a little sip. We'll take a look at this. So, of course, we already know what the three primary colors are. And we know what the secondary colors are. And in this example, they're talking about tertiary colors. And, of course, we probably know what they are. We know the definition. We know what the word means. But it's just helpful to look at them on the color wheel, right? Because we often see the color wheel without the tertiary colors. And for me, those are my favorites. Because, yeah, the yellow, red, blue, orange, violet, green, great. But then those tertiary colors that come in between, the yellow and the orange together, depending on the mix, thinking about Dave's dyeing too, right? What we just looked at, Dave's colors. Thinking about the ratio of yellow and orange, you can get something that's a sunshine color to like a bright burning flame color, right? And with your, for example, red orange, you could go very, very 70s red orange, Brady Bunch Kitchen, to, which I think was blue actually, to like a russet. With the red violet, you could have grapes, like, you know, whiny grapes to a much darker mulberry. With the blue violet, you could go to shades of like hydrangea all the way to plum. I'm, I'm ad-libbing it here, so I'm sure there's better examples. But the blue green um, could go from moss to slate or sage. Yellow green, you get what I'm saying. These in-between colors, I think when you see them in this format on this kind of a um, um, wheel, right, laid out for you, it makes a lot more sense. And even though this isn't in full color, I think it gets your mind going, looking at it and thinking, oh yeah, well, I mean, between red, orange and red, there's tomato, isn't it? I mean, actually, no, it's more like between red, violet and red, isn't it, tomato? It's hard to say, that elusive tomato, I, I don't know. Um, but I thought this was real helpful to look at. And I thought, this, um, this illustration is crazy, isn't it? I mean, this is somebody's drawing um, not that long ago, 1981. See, see what I did there? Not that long ago. But um, this isn't something that you could copy. But this is a great idea. And if you have it in you to do a peacock, this is a really cool way to see a peacock. Because when I saw this page, I thought, man, this is fantastic design for a rug hooker. What a cool design this would be. A tall, skinny shape somewhere in between all the other rugs you've got hanging up, right? Um, I just thought it was a super cool design and they really are showing us with this illustration different color families. Um, and the psychology of color, this whole next part is about the psychology of color. And interesting though this is, um, this can be a bit of a quagmire too because all of this is very uh, subjective. And I, I just don't like these black and white conversations that books of this era do. Well, they say like blue indicates in its devotees depth of feeling and tranquil temperament yeah i mean i guess um usually but there are always going to be exceptions aren't there and you have to account for people seeing colors in different ways right different eyes not just being full out colorblind but seeing colors in slightly different shades and different associations with different colors and that i think for me is the strongest thing about color is the association the reason i love dusty rose so much is because it reminds me of my childhood uh, the reason I like neon so much is it because it reminds me of my childhood in those high school years. I, I still really like brown. Our house was brown growing up. And I remember one day my friend Rebecca, one of the neighbors, came over and there was only a couple of um, cups left. They were the, the Brady Bunch colored cups. And they were like, um, we were choosing between like mustard or brown or something. And she didn't want the brown. And I said, I'll take the brown. Uh, and I was doing reverse psychology because I didn't want the brown. But I said, brown is one of my favorite colors because our house is brown and it reminds me of the, of the good things that are inside of the house. And then she wanted the brown. So that were, and it's just funny because I, every time I think about brown, I think about that conversation with her and I was like probably, you know, nine. Um, but yeah, these colors all mean different things to us. And you can get books on colors and green expresses a, the quest of the person who seeks better conditions for all. Yeah, I'm not 
sure. I'm not sure. If it does for you, then it does, right? That's the bottom line ab about anything that, it, that has any kind of emotional value is the bottom line is if you feel like that's what it is, then that's what it is. And it's not even a conversation for us, right? It's, it's your opinion is the only one that matters. But this book does a really good job of going through every single color and talking about what they kind of denote um, psychologically. So for what it's worth, it's for what it's worth, but it does make some interesting uh, bedside reading. Um, it really is. And then it breaks it down more generally into like warm colors, cool colors. And this is very helpful for conversations about design. It starts to show us some of the most amazing um, illustrations that I've ever seen. And there are like dozens and dozens, if not like, you know, over a hundred or possibly even more in this book. Uh, being a gigantic book. Let me come back down here. Oh, you know what I wanted to show you with this peacock thing? As soon as I saw it, do you remember, did, has anybody seen those books, the illustrated Beatles books? There's, I think it's three. And artists, it's mostly the same few artists illustrate all of their um, songs. And I couldn't find mine at the spur of the moment. It was such a rough day for me. But this is one of the pages I found on the internet of Maxwell Silverhammer. And I think the illustration on the right, I'm pretty sure, is I Feel Fine, um, which is just a weird one. But it reminded me of the peak, that style of the peacock art. A, a hair psychedelic, certainly colorful, right? Just, just threw that in as a side note. So when we're talking about t colors, right, because we are about to talk about color for a while, Think about, this is important, right? Think about this because yes, dark light, dull bright, that is important, but there's, you, you don't need an equal amount of each of those to have a successful color composition, to have harmony. Oh, Susie, were you? Oh, well that, that I, I was truly a baby. I was truly a baby and I still maintain it was not that long ago. It does feel like it was not that long ago. <laughs> um, thinking about warm colors versus cool colors, you know, if, even if you are doing a commercial design, if it's not kitted and you're thinking about your colors, this next part of the show is going to be really important because it should activate for you, um, um, hopefully revelations, um, ideas, inspirations, um, just maybe new color combos because this is what this book is so strong for. In this case, showing us an all warm room. So it is a warm room, but we're not seeing colors that I necessarily, hey, Doreen, associate with a warm room, right? Because I'm not really seeing orange and yellow. They're showing us a off orange, the tomato on the floor, and a lot of pink and red. And those are warm colors, right? Sometimes we think of warm colors as being like orange, yellow, um, orange and yellow, maybe brown. But in this case, this is absolutely a warm room. And if you do a composition and you work in this color palette, these are all warm colors, right? With the exception of obviously the um, green, right? This is just there to pop. That's your dark, light, dull, bright, right? You've got all four of those things in this composition, but it's just a great example um, of a warm room. And it challenges your eye to look at these colors and say, I wouldn't necessarily think of them as warm colors, but they happen to all be warm colors. This is exactly the same room with the same furniture in the same place, but it's been colored with cool colors interesting now for contrast instead of having the green flowers on the table they put the yellow flowers and that is a warm color so they are popping it here and there with just a touch of the opposite dark light dull bright but these are all cool colors i found this so interesting now get ready because i'm going to show you the same composition again but adding neutral elements right so we have got some cool colors we've got some warmer colors but we've got a lot of neutrals right and we've got white here the introduction of white so the wall is neutral the couch is warm colors the floor is a brownie color that could go either way because it's a very cool brown isn't it but interesting adding neutral and cool elements to the warm version of this room now alternately let's look at this one adding warm touches to humanize a cool room now, I liked that cool room the way it was, but I can see what they're doing here. They're trying to balance the colors, and they are using, in their words, the offbeat versions of the colors. We are not really seeing blue. Uh, we are seeing, the, the cushions are blue, maybe on the chairs closest to us, but we are seeing a lot of aqua, and we're seeing a lot of an off pink color, right? I mean, they are really working a little bit offbeat and coming up with some really interesting colors, but all for the same exact room. 
me see what I took next. Let me come down here. Alternate color wheels. Yeah, I thought this was really important. Um, this book is uh, paper pages. It's oversized. It's really easy to look at. And, and for me, my photography was a thing today because of my car problem. I didn't go out to Bethany to take really great photos. So I was taking them in the um, light of the window, which, you know, is comes and goes. But this is the color wheel. And the top one is showing us primary and secondary colors. And the bottom one is showing us the tertiary colors. The outer rim of the wheels also shows us the different tints and hues within the color wheel. So that's a little bit hard to see with my photos, and I'm sorry about that, but they, the, the ring around each one is a little bit different than the inner color. And it's just making the point that looking at two totally different color wheels, it's not a bad idea to do exercises in color wheels, even if you're just doing them on the computer, putting these colors together um, if you're doing some color planning. To me, the bottom color wheel appeals so much more with those tertiary colors than the primary colors, but that is just a personal preference thing, isn't it? I don't tend to go for primary colors, but wait, this room is done in all primary colors, red, blue, and white. And the reason I think I love the way this room looks and I'd be ready to move in at any moment is because it doesn't include the third primary color, yellow. Because for me, when it includes all three colors and we go full on Mondrian, for me, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's boring. It's just, um, it's too much. It's, it's been done. It's not interesting to me. I like, I like things that are a little bit offbeat. For me, this is offbeat. We are totally using primary colors here. Isn't that surprising? Because I don't like primary colors. And now I have to question that opinion that I've held for such a long time. I guess I do like primary colors. Look at that pretty light blue out the door, right? And that kind of shining brown on the coffee table. This color palette, I mean, I love it. This goes real well for me. The amount of patterning in all of the different um, values of the color, right? Because blue is not just blue as, as we know for sure. Now, this is an interesting one too. These are all primary colors here. Um, and somehow it's working because there's very little of the blue and the red. If it was equal for me, I would be overwhelmed with primary colors, but there's a lot of yellow, right? And that really becomes the character of the room. And they've popped it with a very nautical green and a red that's heading more toward pink, like a rosy red. And again, this is a primary palette, unexpected. That's If I were to look at this in a glance and I was given like five seconds to think about um, phrases, associated with this color palette, primary would not come out of my mouth because it has such a tropical citrusy look, right? It's so bright, but it is a primary palette. So interesting use of the color wheel and, and opens up a lot of conversations about the color wheel. That sounds terribly boring, doesn't it? But it is interesting and it is important for any kind of an artist, including rug makers, obviously. So it goes on to say... And all of this is color. There's, you know, more than half of the book is in color, which is helpful. It shows us things like this. And we start to have conversations about, for example, tints and shades of just the color red. Now, the base for these is not all the same. This is not like a paint swatch from the hardware store. These are all different reds. And it would be a great exercise if you had this book to name each of the, these colors because then, then the color wheel in your eyes and in your head has a shape. Because we keep talking about the color wheel like it's shared and universal. Where your idea of red might be different than my idea of red. I know that sounds crazy, but my idea of red is tomato. It's not really the primary red that it is. That's not the red that I would go for in any anything. Um, and we all feel differently about color and we all see it different ways. So at some point, I'm probably going to, with a very light pencil, do that just to get clarity and to get some ideas going in my head and do maybe carnation pink, rose pink. Um, what's that third one? What would you call that third one? What's that fl like? Uh, um, uh, what's it called? Ruga, Ruga, that rose, Ruga Rugosa, something like that. That plant that's that intense fuchsia. Lisa says, My bedroom walls were yellow with a red carpet. You had the partial primary going. Did it work, Lisa? Was it all right? I mean, we just saw that that can work beautifully, but you can see how conversations about color are made very easy. They are personal and they are not ones to have when we are all looking at a color wheel together and saying, this is green, this is blue, this is purple. Conversations about color are to have 
by ourselves, with ourselves. And if colors go together well for you, and if you like the connection between squash yellow and Aegean blue, then that is your golden combo. It might not be mine, but it's yours. And once you name your colors and you define them, it really gets you going, gets the juices flowing, thinking about new projects, right? Or how to maybe fix projects that you're stuck on, things are going wrong and you're thinking, I need to rethink colors. It's a good thing to revisit color in a, in a more complicated um, way than just staring at a color wheel, right? So it takes us through, this is um, tints of brown and uh, red violet, right? It's very, very particular about what it shows us. And it's very complete. Tints of orange, tints of blue green. It's pages and pages. You don't need all those swatches from the um, hardware store when you have a book like this, right? Tints and shades of green, tints and shades of blue, purple. Um, I want to see what Aileen wrote. Hold on one second. Let me come back here. Aileen said, institutions sometimes paint their walls in bright pink to calm their patients down. I wonder if there are effects uh, other colors have. That's a great conversation starter right there because that is so true. Um, and again, it, it, it is always going to differ from person to person, but there are these universal ideas about decorating. The thing about them is they seem to change from generation to generation and sometimes from year to year, right? It's the same as anything these days. You hear someone saying that this works or this will produce this effect, whether it's a vitamin or whether it's saying yes or no to breastfeeding, whatever it is, this year somebody will tell you this and the next year they'll say, nope, changed our minds, we know more. That's the thing about advice, isn't it, that's hard. <laughs> Lisa says, I lo she loved the red and the yellow, but my walls were covered in tigers and horse pictures, and I had an amazing built-in bookshelf that was used to be a double window. Oh, that, that used to be a double window. That is so cool. You know, that reminds me. Let me show you something I didn't take a photo of, but that reminds me of one of the illustrations in this book that might get you. Um, it was an idea, and it was a bookshelf idea. You just triggered it for me. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I'm not going to waste too much time but it was a cool it was a cool idea yeah there we go all right hang on let me hold this page let me see if i can bring this in focus i thought this was really cool this page is showing um these bookcases that you can change the height right of the of the shelves very ikea um and they have different paint and wallpaper going behind each one and i thought ooh, what if you did that and you had some of them like you know to accommodate books, but also obviously vignettes. Um, what if you like made custom rugs to go in the background of these kinds of, like that one's wallpaper, that one's a bit crazy. Let me see if I can come in focus. That one's a bit wacky, wackety stackety. But this one I thought was real pretty and I thought, ooh, I can see a point in time where I'm completely out of wall space with rug stuff. What about doing something like that where the background of your vignette Right, and then you put in oh, decoys. I just love decoys. This person obviously has a, a collection of owls and egrets and wood carvings, right? How cool would it be to be able to put like a custom rug in the background, like a little seascape, and then you put your decoy in there? That'd be super cool, wouldn't it? You could equally do something like that with an old crate, right? Like make a rug that custom fits into the crate, and then the crate becomes a shadow box, and you know, you put whatever vignette you want in there. I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to make a background, talking about our carnival stuff from last week, I think I'm going to make a background of like colored lights and maybe a Ferris wheel and then put my collection of carnival chalkware. I can only talk to you about this, right? These are not normal conversations that I can have as soon as I leave this room and turn the camera off, but I'm going to do it. Um, but it, it's just another idea, isn't it? Susie says blue is coming too. Blue, blue is coming, and I think that's something that doesn't change, is it? that kind of stays the same because blue blue is all around us with the water and the air and all that. And then you get people going, well, the water's not blue. It's reflecting off this, whatever. Or the sky is not blue. You know, all of these counter conversations drive me crazy. But blue is all around us, regardless of where it comes from. Um, and it is calming for that reason, I think, because it brings us back to nature. And certainly green, too, usually has that association. Although I've heard people say that green... Um, is unsettling for them because it's like jungle connotation and, and tangle and chaos. And again, it really depends from person to person. You love that idea? 
<laughs> oh, me too. That one's, I'm going to have to write that in my diary. Otherwise, I'll never remember. Got to remember all these, all these great ideas that pop up during shows. All right, wait a minute. I'm trying to find where I was at. And of course, I can't. Okay, right here. There we go. So here we come into really cool conversations. Right, Aileen? Isn't that a good idea? Let's think of some other things that we could do this with. The, the crate is an obvious one because not all crates are pretty, are they? They don't always have this vintage painting that's intact. But let's think about some other things that we could use that you could hang up that have that nice kind of primitive look that suits what, you know, our craft of, of rug making. Oh, you know what else you could do? I'm going to stop, but you know what else you could do? Um, you could do that very same thing, but instead of in the background doing like a hooked piece, you could do a latch piece. Like how crazy would that look? If you had like a big deep box of some sort and you latched out the background and it was like all crazy, like jungly colors, right? And then you put maybe um, a display of fake silk flowers or something really pretty into the box. I mean, that would be a very nice vignette, wouldn't it? It really depends on what you collect. I'm suddenly really sorry that I sold all of my pink spaghetti poodles on eBay for practically no money um, because that would have made an excellent vignette with like a hooked background. Maybe like the front of Tiffany's store, you know, like with the blue, like 1950 shopping, that kind of thing. Mm. Aileen, yes, the back of a door or the front of a door. That's a great, oh my God, that's a great idea because some doors have panels like this, right? Well, that's a big panel, but some of them have a lot of small panels. You could even pop, oh my God, you could even pop each panel, right? And you know what else you can do? If you wanted to, going along with this idea of the door, if you were to put um, a rug right onto the door, you could then, even if it didn't have a panel, you could get molding from the hardware store, either stain it or paint it to match or not, to contrast, and seal the edge of the rug down by nailing it down, and then you wouldn't even have to finish the rug. Uh-oh, are we onto something here? I mean, this sounds, this sounds amazing. This, see what I mean? This book, I mean, it, ta it, take, it, it takes us to so many different places. I love this idea. We can't stop, we need to talk about this again. Color intensity. I'm off on a bender, as you can tell. Um, color intensity. So this is really important because this speaks to our conversation on dark light, dull bright. So for example, the colors on the right are brighter colors, right? They are more intense. Um, this is a green that has been like little frames, Aileen, exactly. And it would solve the problem of finishing because very few people enjoy the finishing part, right? Just because you like making rugs doesn't mean you like the business of finishing the edges on them. So that would solve that problem too. What a wonderful idea. And in theory, you could do the same thing just on a piece of wood or some kind of backing, right? Just using a molding to nail down around the edge just to frame it, instant frame, right? Becky says, I love this discussion. I'm always trying to think of places for rugs. There you go. You, you just opened up however many rooms in your house times two for the front and the back of every door. Just opened up quite a bit of space. Oh, that's a good idea, Mom. Soundproofing for a teenager's room. You know what? I have just enough time to block off the kids' rooms front and back so I don't have to hear any more YouTube videos. There we go. I was going to say or Encanto, but I'm actually really loving Encanto. So on the right-hand side of this chart, um, yeah, you both had the same idea at the same time. Karen said, then turn the door into a coffee table. Uh-oh. Okay, we're going crazy here. Karen, that is a great idea. Turn the door into a coffee table. You could put a piece of glass over it. Holy mackerel. Wouldn't that be something? And then you know what you could do if there was a distance between the glass. Like, for example, if the glass was being held at a specific height with, like, antique corbels or some kind of architectural knickknacks, or, um, okay, I'll show you this. I have so many chairs, the antique chairs that the children have broken, right? By slamming down on them like um, feral animals. Um, and I keep the rungs to them because they're turned and they're beautiful. And the chair isn't worth gluing back together because I know if it has a colossal atomizing break in the future that I will be the one sitting in it and be in the emergency room. Um, so I keep, I throw out the chair, but I keep all of those wooden corbels. You can think about those things, even like Goodwill, they've got such beautiful chairs and stuff that have, I'm going to return to that thought in a second, but you just made me think, for example, this chair I'm sitting in, right? 
things like that you could use to lift um, the glass part off the table. In some chairs, this one isn't one of them, but you know what I saw once at an antique store? This is just a regular crappy chair from Goodwill. But sometimes a chair has like a second rung here, which is quite decorative, right? I've seen people cut the chair here, like cut it off so it's now this thick, and hang small quilts and hangings from either, like wherever the bar is, you know what I mean? So this gets nailed like this, like a little shelf to the wall, and then they stack some things on top of it, like little vases and little vignettes. And then there's usually, there's not on this chair, it's probably already broken, but there's usually a rung here. And sometimes people, I've seen this in antique stores, drape some little thing over there, like a little rug or a little folded quilt or something. So it's both, it's the front of a beautiful chair that otherwise is broken, that's both a little shelf and a little hanging thing. But that idea about doing that with a door and then using whatever to separate, then in between, between the glass top that you would use for stuff, you could put like magazines and books on your rug, right? Because it wouldn't hurt your finished rugs that are underneath. That's a really good idea. Isn't that a good idea? Float in resin. We, I'm never gonna be able to sleep. I've had two nights of no sleep. That's partly why I'm crazy and emotional. I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going crazy. <laughs> Aileen says you like Encanto now, but not in six months. I've been driving the kids crazy. If you know that Disney movie Encanto, because Jossie hates it when I go, um, we don't talk about Bruno. And I say it like that. And she's like, that's not how you say it. That's not how you say it. Can't you say it normal? And I said, well, they're supposed to be like from South America, right? They would speak with an accent. It drives her crazy. So I've been doing it all the time lately. Oh dear. I love this conversation. <laughs> We're going to be busy, right? We're going to be busy. This is, I'm telling you, you never know what is going to spark a whole bunch of new ideas. Like that episode we did on the carnivals in the parks. I've been getting crazy messages and mail and sketches about projects that people are working on. It's good to snowball and it's good to talk together. And, and uh, this is such a good platform because everybody's so good about building on each other's ideas. I just love it. We are so lucky to have each other here. So color intensity is a conversation we have often and it's a big deal. It's not as exciting as what we're talking about. But I love this page because it talks about the relative dullness or brightness of a color versus its intensity. So in other words, going across, reading this across like it's a book, that green has been neutralized with red on the left, the top left, but then again on the top right, instead of being neutralized with red, in other words, dulled, it has been intensified with yellow. So you see how one color, and, and not, not going toward black and white, because normally when we think about mixing colors and changing colors, we think, should I make it darker or lighter? No, this is, ta this is talking about taking a color and either making it duller or brighter with a completely different color, not, not black and white. So red, the second one down, is being neutralized. By neutralized, they mean dulled with green. And on the right side, it's being intensified with yellow. Blue neutralized with orange becomes quite dull. That, that one didn't come out too good. But then the same color intensified with yellow. You see how this works. And the point of this, the, the point of this conversation is, you know, when you are experimenting with color or even dyeing, it's important to remind yourself that going darker does not mean that you have to go to black, brown, or gray right? Or going whiter does not mean, obviously not with dyeing, but that you would go to white. You can go, if you want darker, you can go to red. It's going to dull, right? It's going to, it's going to counter what's already happening with that color, depending on the color, right? So this is a whole other conversation and how interesting it is. The swatches that we have historically seen with rug hooking are lightest value to darkest value, right? And that is perfect for shading. But if we're not talking about shading, and we're just talking about color, right? All of these pictures that we've been looking at where you look and you go, those pillow cushions don't match each other. Well, they don't match each other, but they're heavenly, aren't they? That's because this is what they're doing. Instead of substituting a light or dark value that you would expect, they're substituting a light and a dark value that is unexpected. And that is a whole different conversation. That is mad science, right? That must be one of the movies from the 80s. Was it called Mad Science? Weird Science or something? Something Science. I can't remember now. You have to remind me. 
Um, this is an important conversation. We have to come back to this in the future. For those of you who like to work with color, this is a really important thing to think about because with this whole school, 20th century school of teaching rug hooking, um, the, the idea of, of talking about and, and creating your own color wheel, you know, wool um, for rug hooking by dyeing it is a wonderful exercise and very, very useful and helpful. But what we don't get to and what we don't talk about is making colors that are darker, lighter, duller, brighter with other colors, with other evolved colors, not black and white. So this is a this is a whole new world talking about Disney movies, a whole new world. And it's an important one because it is limitless, absolutely limitless. Weird science. OK, there we go. <laughs> I get excited. Oh, Sally, I didn't put that together. I knew the name, but I didn't put that together. I gotcha. You're going incognito. Good for you. Aileen says, rugs and set into cupboard doors too. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? I mean, you can always use more textile around. And when you think about it, when you think about it, not just a question of running out of space, right? Not just that. But when you think about it, if you've ever toured like a castle in Europe, there's carpets on like every wall. Tapestries, not carpets, tapestries, because they, they're woven, right? And they're meant as wall hangings um, and as storytelling devices and warnings. But, um, and that's for warmth, but it's the same idea for us, isn't it? It's a lovely, cozy thing to surround ourselves with textiles. I have to show this so that it was worth spending the time on those nails. So let's look at, we're getting late as usual. Um, this is gonna have to be a to, to be continued, but our brainstorming is worth it. Um, sorry, I'm coming, I'm coming. There we go. All right, relative color, right? Still talking about color just a little bit, and then we'll look at some more examples. But this is another important thing. Do you ever, do you have any of these books around on optical illusions? I mean, it seems like, it seems like a waste of time, but it's not, is it? Because looking at books on optical illusion are actually super helpful in helping us um, think about color. Because the, looking at this diagram, the, what we're talking about is relative color. It is still the color red, and it looks different relative to what is immediately next to it. And this is one of our big pigs with rug hooking, is getting those colors right, because even though you lay out your palette and you like all the colors and it's just the way you want, when you start hooking them into place, you often find it's not working. And it's not working because it's very hard, you know, ahead of time, to gauge the relative color, meaning the color that it will become when it's next to the color that's next to it. When you have them laying out on your table in a spectrum, you think, mwah, all my favorite colors. Didn't I do great? And then you hook them and you think, it's a pig's breakfast, what went wrong? I'm not cut out to do this, what's wrong with me? I do it, I do it every time I hook a piece. Um, Aileen says, Lisa Briggs of Briggs and Little. Lisa, I think you've had that question before. You should say, why yes. I love Briggs and Little. I'm just looking forward to what our next thing is. Let me see what I picked out for you next. I tried to, there was so much content in this book. I tried to pick things that I thought we could have fun with. And we, I think we are doing a good job of it. I like this illustration because um, it's showing us what could be a hooked rug on the carpet. They're not showing us a lot of hooked rugs in 1981. They are showing us a lot of rugs that could be hooked, but they're not showing us a lot of traditional hooked rugs. Because as you can see, the style of decorating, even in the formal rooms that they've shown us, is not really that country primitive. It's just not there. There's a real push for modern because country primitive was very popular in the 70s. So they're moving away from that. Cat coming out of the litter box. It's like, room, gone. Um, so we're not seeing a lot of those traditional touches. They are keeping the fine furniture because why wouldn't they? It cost a fortune. But they are taking away the sort of accoutrements that go along with the last era of decorating. And they will come back almost immediately. But in the meantime, we don't see a lot of examples like this. This looks to me like it could be a large hooked rug. It's very organic. And the thing that I love about the look of this is the way, the complementary colors, right? So this whole page is about complementary colors, the red with the green. 
And wouldn't you think that's never going to work? It'd be like Christmas all year round. Well, it does work, doesn't it? Because it's like a real pistachio green. And then that there it is a bright Christmas red and it is a Christmas green. But on that white backing with a little bit of navy, it looks completely different. It looks like a 1980s Laura Ashley dress, doesn't it? The print. I mean, it's so pretty. So this opens up quite a few pages uh, coming up here. Um, oh, do you? You collect Briggs tins. Lisa, when I see one, I'm going to pick them up for you at an antique store and bring you a surprise when I come visit. Um, blobs like Ritamir floor on the rug. Absolutely. Let's look at that again. Karen, let's go back. The Ritamir blogs, blobs. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point. And you know, that rug, the blobs uh, framed out with that super formal sort of uh, Native American border. It's a double border, but they're both very geometric and formal. And that's a nice contrast. That's another sort of Pearl McGowan trick, having that very loose organic inner rug with at least one border that is super opposite in style. Uh, it goes really well. I don't know why. There's no reason um, artistically that that should work. But it's one of those great, happy accidents. It always does work. Isn't it amazing how much yellow they show us in this book? I mean, it's most um, pictures. The, the most prominent color is yellow. And, and I wonder if that is coming out of those earthy colors of the 70s, if it's um, a push away from the darkness but not being so close to the 70s and 81. I wonder if it's, okay, coming out of the cat, cat coming out of litter box, no more 70s colors, but they wanted to hold on to the yellow, um, but a brighter version of the yellow because there is an excessive amount of yellow in these pictures. This is beautiful. A room in, in that, in, I, I always struggle with this word, uh, in that, analog, uh, analogous colors. Why do I have such trouble with that? Analogous colors, meaning all in a row, right? So in other words, this color scheme, think about the straight color wheel now, just the straight color wheel. So in this room, we've got like yellow, yellow, orange, orange, right? So that's analogous, there we go, colors, uh, 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 analogous. Um, and analogous colors work great. So these are all warm colors, but if you think about it, this is more color wheel talk, right? If you think about it, think about the color wheel if you were to do, for example, analogous colors, for example, blue, green, green, yellow, green, yellow, those are analogous colors. They come right after each other on the color wheel, but you'd be crossing warm and cool and it would still work and it would give you the same feel. That's why it's so important to have these conversations about the color wheel, particularly if you're designing. And if you're not, I'm sorry, because then this episode isn't as interesting for you. But I like thinking about this because these are all conversations that are important and these are not things that we typically get to when we talk about row cooking using analogous colors red red violet violet blue again you're crossing into you're crossing right across the border right across the equator of the warm to the cool again and it will still work the same way and your eye will still read them the same way and these are maybe the kinds of palettes that you should be thinking of when you're just sitting there blank and doing color planning Think about the things that we're talking about now or rewind this episode and think about the tricks or get this book. I'm sure it's on eBay and I'm sure it costs like nothing. It should be like $3.99 free shipping because it's not like it's a special book. It's going to be special to us if you find it handy. Um, Color-wise, I find this unbelievably handy. So, all right, let me come back here. Um, this book talks about color in a way, in, in a very accessible way, but in a way that you don't usually talk about it. When you talk about color in art books, it gets very highbrow, doesn't it? It gets very boring and highbrow, and it's like, I, I can't stomach it. But in a decorating book that is this in-depth, talking about color theory, this 500 pages worth, is very helpful because they're not talking to me in a highbrow way, right? They're not all high horse talking about color and why it works. They're just saying, hey, these colors go together on the color wheel. Look at the color wheel. One, two, three, here they are. And your brain goes, oh my God, that's so easy. I wish I would have been told that years ago because I've always struggled with the color wheel and why it makes sense. Um, this book is excellent for breaking it down. This is another super good example. This is a monochromatic room. Now, how can this work so well? This is a very calm room, isn't it? What a beautiful sort of um, stage is set here for sculpture, for pottery. It looks like there's some sort of Asian pottery, also some Delft, right, or Blue Flow or whatever. Um, 
but having this commonality, the blue, many colors of blue, many shades of blue, right? All of it is going to work together and it is monochromatic, but it isn't boring. It really sets the stage, doesn't it? I found that one really very relaxing. You know, and then they show us things like this, which I think are also helpful. This isn't so much about color as it is about feel, right? That the vibe that it's giving you. Um, this vibe is casual friendliness. So this is real specific to decorating, having like a wooden wall, I guess now we'd say shiplack or something like that, shiplap, um, and a couple of vintage chairs, which then maybe weren't. But, you know, the color schemes, they are, again, using the warmth of the natural materials, the rock and the wood, and they're using um, complementary colors because this is another red and green. Sally says, I'd like to use a painting as a source for a room's color. Well, you know, Sally, it's so funny that you say that because a whole part of this book that I didn't go into because it wasn't very visual um, but was a great conversation was talking about where to get your color sources. Maybe we will get to it because I'll never get... I mean, look where I am in the book. We're not going to go through the whole book, but this is like what we've talked about so far. Um, and I don't want to rush it because there really are some good conversations about color in here that might come in handy if you're doing any kind of color planning yourself. But that is a big thing that's covered in here is where to pull from. And one of the um, things they come up with immediately is a painting that you love. Uh, to very small things like a stamp, um, your favorite colors of nail polish, you know, just things that you don't necessarily think of that... If someone gives you that prompt while you're sitting there and you go, oh, the spines of my book, and then you look over at your books and go, yeah, I, I can see how those would work. That's super wintry palette there, all those uh, forest greens, Dave, and all of the navies and the different cognac browns, right? I mean, it, it's amazing what a prompt can do, and that's what a book like this is great for. So many prompts. You can see why I haven't been sleeping well. My brain is just going uh, overtime with this year. <laughs> this, this, I just had to show you this picture because this page specifically says that this room is the quiet room for study and serious talks. Now, all I could think was, it gave me a stomach cramp when I read that, because all I could think was, man, I would not want to be called into this room because you know you're going to get a serious talk if you go in here. It looks so relaxing. It almost looks like a psychiatrist's office, but very specific for serious talks. It's like, no, thank you. Let's fast forward to that. Don't think about any kind of serious talks. Let's have fun. This was the one I used as the thumbnail. Um, and this, this, um, this one is called Gay and Lively Atmosphere. And it sure is. And, you know, when I look at this, it almost looks like it's a latch or high pile. Maybe I was going to say Raya, but probably not because those are way too time intensive. Um, but it is a, it's certainly a tufted rug of some sort, like a high pile. Again, the yellow. And they've, they've got elements of modern, right, with the coffee table and stuff. But also the old, uh, looks like a 1950s style kind of bamboo lamp and some Delft uh, vases in the background. And there's a real mix. It's a real sort of mutant here. And then very, very country colored checkered um, pillows on the floor, very casual and informal. But look at that beautiful piece of art on the wall. When I came to that, I thought, I think one of the reasons I like this image so much is, I mean, I, this is another room, pretty much all of them that I've shown you tonight, other than the room for serious talks, um, I could just I could just go in there, snuggle right down on that couch, start working on my hooking, or just take a nap. Yeah, that's not going to happen. But you know what I mean? So cozy and so inviting, right? So I think the thing that I like about this room the most is that is the textile heaviness, right? Like all of the furniture is none of it's bare wood; it's all upholstered. Um, obviously, not the table, but the textile curtains are a beautiful pattern that might match the couch. Definitely some mismatching other patterns going on here. I see a chair at the table in the background that looks like it matches the throw pillows on the floor. But then that piece on the wall is probably a painting. And it does look like a color study, a little bit of a Mondrian. But wouldn't that be for a large piece of art, whether it's tufted or whether it's looped, um, wouldn't that be a great large over-the-sofa piece for you to do some kind of textile color study. And part of what I like about this, and I mean, it does have the kind of tic-tac-toe feel, but it's some repeats, it's some shading variations, it's just a lot of play, isn't it? And it sets the tone for the whole room. And because of that piece over the couch, they are able to pull on so many different colors and they all work. And I thought that is gonna be, that's a big um, to be continued in my mind. 
because I could absolutely see spending some time making a beautiful big piece like that for an informal room. And it would be like an invitation to load the room up with all kinds of colors and mismatching patterns and textiles. And um, on the other hand, you know, this room is considered harmonious. And this is the part where they do start talking about pulling from different color schemes like autumn leaves. There's a whole page about walking through the autumn leaves and pulling colors. But this page is talking about harmonious multicolor schemes. Um, so this is everything, right? This is not the monochromatic. This is not the complementary. This is not the anagulus, anagulus. You know what I mean? It's mixing and matching. This is the mutt. But they're able to do it because they're often putting a, either a piece of art on the wall, which they're doing that trick again here, but also the slip covers or the upholstery on those two comfy chairs, the club type chairs across the way, they're able with these little devices to introduce a lot more colors with just one or two pieces in the room, aren't they? This, is, this works exactly the same way with two dimensional design as it does with decorating. If you introduce something, I mean, don't those chairs look like mottled wool or spot dyed wool? I mean, it works just the same way. And then you're able with those mixy matchy colors to marry in all of every every co color family that is represented in those big mixes, right? Because those are like the focal points of the room, the heavy patterning pieces. I thought that was just another great example, coziness. Now, this is quite different. Um, and this is one of these, for me, wind up pieces of art. It's like, it's basically a painting that someone painted red and, and made money on. That to me is the ultimate wind up. But this is called Magnetic Modern. I don't get the reference. Um, but I think they mean that it is magnetic, like you're drawn to it, because it's very color driven and it's very controlled color, isn't it? it this is a, nat a very neutral palette and the beige is really dominating the room here. But at the same time, they have got color pops going on and they're warm colors. So they've mixed the neutrals with the warms, but we're not seeing any cool colors except for that neutral. But the neutral is not a cool, right? It's right in between. It's the middleman. Um, interesting. This appeals to me less, and this to me personally seems less exciting than even the monochromatic room that was done all in blue, because um, it just feels more limited to me. There's, there's three colors here, beige, red, and yellow, whereas with the blue room, even though it was blue, there were 20 different colors of blue in there. It just depends on your style and what you like, right? Dave says, look to birds for color combinations. Nature seldom gets it wrong. Abs Dave, that's a brilliant thing to add. Absolutely look at birds. That's a great idea. Think of all the books you can find this summer, right? All the optical illusion books, decorating books, bird watching books. Think of all the great ideas you're going to write in the margins and you're going to take with you. You're going to have your little bag of tricks going. So by the time next winter comes and you're doing your hooking or you're punching like full time sitting around doing it, you're going to have so many ideas and plans in place. It's going to be such a relief. Um, and you'll be in such a happy place, all set up, you know. Now, what's this? This, I'm going to stop in a minute, too, because I'm getting tired, too. I've, I did a bit of crying today, too, just because it's been, you know, you don't want to hear that the engine on your car cracked when you've been, you know, vi vigilant about bringing it in constantly and spending a fortune on maintaining it. Don't get me started, right? So this is interesting. The blues and the lavenders in this restful room are borrowed from the area rug over the fireplace, and the coffee's, uh, coffee table's mosaic top. Ooh, I didn't even notice that. Coffee table has that very sort of Indian flavor, doesn't it? We do see a lot of these now. Easy to make too. If you are any good with a jigsaw, you can cut that fretwork yourself and just break a bunch of plates and grout them down. Um, that was another thing I used to love to do back in the day. No time for that now. This is one of these rare instances of using white, and I am not a fan of the color white, but I have to say in this instance, it is it gives a very bohemian look, doesn't it? Very studio apartment look um, because it really leaves your eye open to accept that whatever that is, it looks like a rug to me over the mantle, right? Some kind of a hung textile over the mantle. Um, yeah, it says area rug over the fireplace. That really... That's a great clue for us to look at the, that's got a pile to it, but it doesn't have to. It's just that one does. Um, it really ties in well with the blues and it ties in well with the upholstery, giving just a beautiful feel. And again, it's funny, they're not using what look like homemade rugs on the floor in any of these examples. Possibly. It's hard to tell. 
But when we get a real distinct rug like this, it's, it's been on the wall, which is just funny. Um, not funny. I mean, they're considering it art, which is which is nice. Um, always for a rug as a, as a piece of art. Um, this is an example of a theme -y room. So what's the theme here? Well, it's flowers, right? It's a lot of flowers, but I have to say they keep it interesting. It's another white room, but they keep it interesting with scale. And you can do this in your designing too. If you decide, I want a lot of flowers, it's coming into spring and summer, I want something with a lot of flowers, do a lot of flower patterning, but do it in a different scale. Don't do it all in the same scale or it's going to go all Hanna-Barbera and all flow into each other. Do it in a different scale so it remains distinct and you create interest, right? I think that's interesting. So let me see, should I do, let me see if I want to do one more. I'll do, I'll do one more and then we'll stop. What's this? Oh, isn't that pretty? How to build color schemes. This gets a bit more complex. Maybe we should start with this one next time. They're talking about using zigzags, um, bold, uh, black, cocoa, bittersweet, and white. Oh, what a color combo. Black, cocoa, bittersweet, and white. Wow. So this is obviously a very warm color palette, but they dropped that neutral into the background again. And with the yellows popping, they love their yellows. Isn't that nice? Isn't it funny how even in the illustration, they're trying not to show us green out the window because they're trying to make the point that the color is very controlled here. They give us a little green vase in the foreground, but that's about it. It looks like they're holding on to their 70s era couches here and even possibly their acrylic furniture, which is so untouchably expensive now that it's crazy. But this is another beautiful um, color scheme. Let's come back to that one. Oh, Lisa, that's a great idea. You look at Pinterest for color combo cards. Color is such a, it's such a big thing. It's once you lock into an idea, it, it, it feels so good, doesn't it? Um, and sometimes, you know, if you're a person who has a huge stash of materials and it makes sense for you to be going through it, let me make a special mark on this page so we don't get lost. Put a post-it note in there. Dave, I'll put your tomato and your chartreuse and your apricot in there. Um, it feels so good to make a decision about color because if you have a huge stash, you can lay your stuff out on the table. And I do always find that problematic because I just feel like whether you want to or not, no matter what kind of hurry you're in or if you're on a trip and you don't have other stuff with you, you often do hit a wall because of that relative color problem that the colors just don't look the same when they're actually next to each other. And it changes and skewers the picture because you're picturing them the way that they looked when they were laid out on your table, right? I mean, um, and this is, ve it's very hard to get away from it. This is, there's not an easy solution to this problem, but if you do this every time, like I do, just know there's a lot of us who do it every time. You think you're there. You say, I'm not going to fool with it. I've got all my colors all stitched up and it turns out you just don't. And that's just the way it goes. Knowing more about color theory and how colors go together, identifying colors, um, being able to place them on the color wheel and, and know in the back of your mind these tricks about tertiary colors and enag, enag colors. Um, knowing these tricks is going to help you make good decisions about color to begin with. And then you'll be on better footing and there'll probably be less chance of you having to fool or substitute colors later because um, that is frustrating and it does happen. Oh, Gail. Gail, good morning. But yeah, I think Pinterest, that's one of the thing, pin, p things Pinterest is great for. Um, I hate, my thing with Pinterest is I just hate being on the computer and I always like to have a book in my hand. I just cannot stop looking at the cover of this book. This is going to be my dream room. Did you ever have that thing when you were young? I'm telling you, I still have a sore throat after those um, ramen noodles. Did you ever have that thing when you were young and you used to look at pictures and magazines of rooms and things and you would think, one day, not only will I obviously be rich, but secondly, um, I'm going to create this room exactly the way that it was in this picture. I mean, I have scrapbooks that I made of pictures from magazines that I cut out for years that were the perfect room and I was going to have them all. And at some point I thought, well, I really better marry somebody like super rich because I need a lot of rooms because I love all of these photographs and I have to be able to accommodate. It's just the kind of thinking you do when you're young, isn't it? You think of 10 names that you like for kids and then you think you're going to have 10 kids and then you have one and you're like, I don't know about that. 
but it's just the way it is. And the point is that these, um, I was going to say period books, but it's not that old, 1981. These, these books that are not new on the shelf at Michael's and Barnes and Noble right now, these older books, um, they give such a different perspective, right? Because you know that whatever you're looking at now for your advice as a reference and as a guide, that's going to be out of style next year anyway. So what's the difference, right? You might as well get this for $3.99 or something like it. Be looking at those ideas because they're just as viable as the ones that you're getting now in a $17 magazine at the checkout of Michael's, right? So anyway, this has given me a lot of pleasure and a lot of fun to look at. And it's given me a, a reason to dress up very silly tonight. But um, I'm tired. I think I'm going to hit it. We went right to the end as usual. And we'll pick this up again. I'll be with you. Um, yeah, I'll be with you Monday. Just think about it. I have to bring the car in on Wednesday, but I'll figure all that out. I'll certainly be with you Monday, and we'll talk more about um, how the week is going to play out for next week now. Um, I'm just, I have it in my mind that maybe the car is going to die, and I'm just going to have a car payment of an extra $400 a month from now until death. And still have to get another car and pay for that, too. I just have to come to peace with that so that there can only be good news on the horizon. And hopefully, glass half full, that won't happen. And hopefully, I'm in a good enough mood that I don't take a nosedive next week. But you know that if I do, and I post in the group that I'm having a bad day or um, having technical problems, you know I'm having a massive breakdown because the car's engine is about to crack. Um, but hopefully, that won't happen, and I'll keep it together. I will certainly be with you Monday because that's pre-appointment. And let's look more at this. Let's complete this conversation on color theory uh, and brainstorming and bring all of the ideas you think of as a result of our conversation and the, the side conversation here. Bring all those ideas with you Monday and um, share them again, right? We can top up our idea bank. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. They're such jerks. I'm going to say something negative. But, you know, with people like car people, just there's so, there's so many people that fit into this category, right? The, sometimes the DMV people, like all of these situations, you know that they're not going to give you something if they don't have to. And you know that you are supposed to know the open sesame words, but you don't know them. So you hope that you say them, but you probably won't because you don't know what they are. And they're not going to tell you because then they'd have to give it to you, right? To give you the thing that you want. This is the problem with the way life is right now. It is counter common sense in every situation. And everything seems so rigged and unfair that it's crazy. But we will see what happens. Fingers crossed. I do not need any more uh, stress at this moment. Paula, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a wonderful session. You gave me so many ideas tonight. I'm going to have to, I'm going to take my turkey pills tonight instead of my sleeping pills. I've been taking too many sleeping pills. I'll take three turkey pills. I did two, but to be honest, I'm doing three so that I fall asleep because I'm going to be, my head's going to be in, deep in this book looking for more ideas and more things to cover with surfaces of with our, with our beautiful rug. It will work out. It always does work out and everything happens for a reason. So, and you know, the good thing is that this, this is happening with the car. The engine is rough because of this stupid problem with the oil that I have been super on top of and yet it still happened. Um, and finally today is the day that the person looked at it that had the information or the sensor looked hard enough or well enough to say, oh my God, this is what's been happening for five years. Doesn't matter. It's water under the bridge. Um, I forget where I was going with that. Yeah. Oh, but it's a good thing that it didn't happen. Like suddenly the car started smoking black smoke while I was driving around with the kids at night or something, like coming back from my mom's in the dark. It could have been worse. It can always be worse, right? And then I would have to pull over in some godforsaken place while there's smoke billowing out of the car. That would have been worse. So it's not as bad as it could be. And ho hopefully it won't be. But um, yeah. Think of a nice calming room. I'm going to I'm gonna open the page up to that blue room with that little carved uh, statue of a horse. I'm going to look at that in bed. I'll write my diary and say all the bad things that happened, and I'll write our good ideas down, and then I'll open up to the blue page, and that will help a lot. Have a play some forest bird songs. That's a great idea. That's a really good idea. You know, I think I will because I'm trying to get Jossie to bed a little bit earlier, too. We heard from the school that she has been falling asleep on the toilet, and... I mean, that's, that's something, isn't it? Um, but for some reason, these kids, ever since they were born, tiny, they, they have always been kids who slept through the night, starting on night one. I can only remember one or two times in my life that these kids woke me up at night as infants. It just never happened. They were like big sleepers. But even when they were tiny babies, they did not want to go to sleep until 12 or something. It was extreme night owlism. And I'm an extreme 
early to bed, early to rise person. Like, I would love to be up at five. But it has not been like that with these kids, both of them. And she just does not want to go to sleep at night. And it's even when she goes to sleep, she's just awake in bed for two hours talking with her eyes open. I mean, she's like me. It's like a problem. But you, obviously, she can't have sleeping pills like I can to knock her out. No velvet hammer for her. No, you know, cocktail before bed. So she's been falling asleep on the toilet. So the, the bird song is a great idea. But I said to her, we should start. We have this program called Epic on the phone. It's um, children's books that are spoken. And we pulled up some the other night that are like poetry. And somebody reads them and they do beautiful like wind chime noises in the background and stuff. And um, I mean, it's just that beautiful lyrical poems and uh, super relaxing and imagery and everything. And I saw her little eyes like, and I thought, yes, yes, go to sleep. No toilet sleeping. God, we're the family with the toilet sleeper. It's awful. So that's a great idea. I think I'm going to put on Epic, listen to some poems, and then we will drift off to some bird song. Um, that's a great idea. Thank you so much for such a nice night, everybody. I was not having a good day, but we turned it around, and I, appreci I appreciate your friendship and you being here, and it is fun to get together, develop a sleep regime. I've been trying to do that since she was a baby. She is just, both of them, they are just the worst. I don't know what it is. It's like past life stuff. They just do. And Teddy has no problem waking up. I mean, he's fine with eight hours of sleep, but she needs more. And I don't know what to do. She's just electric. It's not like she's doing anything. She's just not sleeping. It's a, it's a tough one. It's turn, It's another huge stressor, you know. All right. Well, have fun this weekend with all your stuff and your projects. I'm very sad that I'm not going to Cape Cod this weekend, but I am going next weekend. And maybe that gives you the chance to get out there for next weekend because I will be there ragging it up with those Amish toothbrushes uh, rugs. And it's going to be a super, super fun class. And the weather hopefully will be even warmer and uh, more seasonal sort of next weekend, another spring weekend, I hope. So I hope to see you there. But in the meantime, have a great weekend. You can always reach me at ribbonkeddyhooking at gmail.com. Um, I am working to get orders out, all the custom dye orders. We, we uh, listed everything on ribbon candy hooking. Um, almost everything at this point that it was a swatch hat is also individual yardage starting at quarter yard. So those are all there if you want them. And tomorrow, because I'm not going to be at the Cape, I still have to finish the book and finish the Prati project urgently. But I am going to do those dyeing projects and get out all of the dye things that people ordered. So if you're interested in materials and stuff, I'll be getting to those either tomorrow or this coming week. So all of that is there for you. And you can reach out if there's anything else that you want because you know that on the 30th, levels off for me and I, I am all yours again and I can be normal again. Have a great weekend and I will see you on Monday for coffee time at noon Eastern Standard Time. I'll see you then.